In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. By the early 700s, most people of the Roman Empire would be Christians, at least in May. But some of these people who joined the church brought into the church the pagan mentality. The pagan mentality of trying to gain the favor of God and trying to please God so that God does for them whatever they want. Some of these people started to treat icons as objects to whom God fulfills their wishes. And they started to honor the icons in themselves. They would honor icons that would be worn out, that would not depict Christ or the Theotokos or the saints anymore because they would be worn out, but they would still honor the wood or the stone or whatever material that icon is made of. At about the same time, we witness the appearance and the rise of Islam in the history of humanity. And of course, Islam started in the Arabic Peninsula, and then it spread to Northern Africa, it spread also towards North, to what is now day Turkey, but that area used to belong to the Byzantine Empire the Roman Empire that became the Byzantine Empire, and it was a Christian miracle. Now the Muslims coming from the south would attack the Byzantine Empire from southeast. And they would win many of these wars against the Byzantine Empire because the Byzantine Empire at the time was already starting to have some problems with corruption, with bad politics, but some of the Byzantine emperors thought, you know what? We are losing the wars against the Turks, against the Muslims, because we have icons and they don't. Instead of looking at themselves and trying to see what are we doing wrong, maybe our army is not strong enough, maybe we don't have the right policies, no, they blame it on God. Their God is stronger than our God. In Islam, they don't have icons, they don't have representations of God, because Allah in Islam never became incarnate. Right? So it makes sense in Islam not to depict God in any kind of iconography, because their God is in somewhere, and he never revealed himself. He spoke to Muhammad, Muhammad spoke to the people, but God never became incarnate. That's why in Islam they don't have icons or any representations of God. But some of the Byzantine emperors thought they are winning the wars against us because maybe, because we have icons, God is against us because we are worshipping idols. <laughs> and they said, you know what? We are going to be done with the idols. And they gave orders to have the icons destroyed and burned, and the icons in churches covered, or at least to be higher so that the people could not reach them to honor them and to, to kiss the idols. This was the so called iconoclast crisis. For, a, for more than a hundred years, the Byzantine Empire was in a kind of a civil war because of the icons. Because of course there were some people who said, no, this is not about this. We have icons because God revealed himself to us, became part of matter, and we are to present God to the world because he revealed himself to us. Thank God for St. John of Damascus, who lived outside of the Byzantine Empire, he lived in Damascus in Syria, which was already Muslim territory, and the Muslims would allow St. John of Damascus to write his theology. And he, he became the main defender of the icons. It 
Eventually, the several ecumenical council in, in, uh, in uh, Nicaea in 787, the holy fathers of the church decided that it is not only okay to have icons, we have to have icons, because if we refuse to depict God with material means, ultimately we refuse to believe and to recognize the reality of the incarnation of God. And if God did not become man, humanity is not saved. If God did not become part of the creation, part of matter, the universe is not saved. That's why they say we have to have animals. Guess what? After the Seventh Ecumenical Council, another emperor came. The Seventh Ecumenical Council was called, was called by the Empress Irene. But then, after her, another emperor came. And he again was an iconoclast emperor, again he was against the icons, and finally in 843, on this first Sunday of Great Land, Empress Theodora was in favor of the Orthodox of the Church and of the icons. He allowed the church again to bring the icons back into the church, and this is what we celebrate today. The restoration of the icons and the triumph of the Orthodox faith over the heresies, that's why it is called the Sunday of Orthodoxy. So today we celebrate the restoration of the icons. But as we could see, one of the reasons why we had this iconoclast crisis was because some people honor the icons too much, almost to the point of worship. And it was not okay. And it is not okay. Why do we have icons? I told you one of the reasons. That because, I think, I told you the main reason. Because the Son of God, God Himself became, He revealed Himself to us, He became part of man. That's why we revealed Him and His saints through material means. What is the Greek word? There is another reason why we have the icons. And this is what the people in the, seven, in the seven countries did not understand. And this is what many Christians, Orthodox Christians, even today, do not understand. Why did the Son of God become incarnate, reveal himself to us in a body, in a material body? To restore the image of God in man. To restore the image of God in man. Very good, Pastor. Thank you, brother. To restore the image of God in man. Because from the beginning, according to the Bible, God created humanity in His image. In the Septuagint, I was telling you in the did you know lately about the Septuagint, this. Greek translation of the Old Testament scriptures done by the Jews in Alexandria in Egypt about 300 years before Christ. In the Septuagint, when the Jews translated the book of Genesis from Hebrew into, uh, into, into Greek, what do you think that was the word that they used there in for that God created humanity in his image? What's the Greek word there? What do you think in the Septuagint? Hmm? Icona, exactly. Icona. Icon to stay who? God created humanity as his icons. And we refuse to be the image of God. And because we refuse, God himself, through whom, by whom, and in whom everything was created, as St. Paul says in the letter to Colossians, God himself had to become human to reveal to us who we are to be. And this is what St. Paul says very clearly in the letter to Colossians when he speaks about, of, when he speaks about our Lord Jesus Christ being the image of the invisible God. In the original Greek New Testament, he called to say who? He called to say who in the beginning he called to say our Lord Jesus Christ came to reveal to us this is who we are called to be. 
Now this word ikon comes from the verb ikon, which means to be like, which means properly to mirror like, re, like to mirror like representation. We are to reflect, to mirror the image, to, re, to reflect God into the world. We are to be mirrors of God into the world. And that's another very important reason why we have icons. We have icons not only to kiss them and to honor them and then to go our way. We are to become icons. We are to be restored. That's what we are to celebrate today. By the grace of God, this restoration of the icons happened on the first Sunday of Great Land in 843. At the providential time, when now we are in Great Land, we are called to be restored and to become icons of God. This is what we should really celebrate today. But what do you think? And this is a difficult question. And I'm not going to ask you to answer right away. This will be your homework for next time. Think about this for one week. And next Sunday, we'll start our sermon organization with trying to answer this question. What it is better, what it is easier and better? To honor icons or to become icons ourselves? It's not an easy question. Think about it for a week, and God willing, next Sunday we will talk about this. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen.